Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to yet another lore video talking about the war for Armageddon. And today we will be talking about the second war. Angron, get back in your fucking hole. Go pick on Khan or something. We're not talking about you yet. I swear that boy has some serious psychological issues. Anyways, where were we? Oh yes, the Second War for Armageddon. Starting 57 standard years to the day after the first invasion. Or 998 millennia 41 to be precise. This time, Gazgul had brought more friends. He had also brought an actual plan. He landed on Armageddon the first time, mostly by accident, while this time he was going there properly, because it was the first planet that had actually stopped him. As for the Imperium, they had also considerably reinforced the planet of Armageddon. You see, the planet was rather important. It was uncomfortably close to Terra, first and foremost. Secondly, it was one of the most heavily industrialized planets in the Imperium, producing vast amounts of resources and, of course, armored fighting vehicles, as well, as, of course, as being the home of the the Armageddon Steel Legion. It was a very, very important planet. It also happened to sit on one of very few stable warp currents surrounding the Sol system, making it perhaps one of the most strategically important planets currently under threat. And while previously the planet had been considered a fairly low priority, simply because there wasn't anything nearby that could threaten it, Gazgul had come pretty much as a bolt of thunder out of a blue sky, scaring the absolute shit out of the Imperium, and uh, they'd be damned if they were going to get caught by surprise again. And so the planet's garrison was massively increased. During the time of the First War, it had an absolute skeleton crew. It had a little bit more than most planets due to its strategic importance, but all in all, it was a very, very lightly defended planet that mostly relied upon Imperial Navy patrols nearby and its orbital defences, still more than enough to scare off anything that the planet was expected to face, raiding fleets and pirates and stuff like that, not full-out orc wags. And while, of course, the planet was more than capable of supporting millions, if not hundreds of millions, of Imperial Guardsmen, those millions were scattered out throughout the galaxy fighting other wars that required their manpower considerably more than garrison duty on Armageddon. That priority had, of course, shifted quite drastically with Gazgul's ever so inconsiderate entrance in the nearby system. And while the beast had been chased off-planet during the First War, he hadn't gone particularly far. He had indeed invaded one of the main production planets outside of the Armageddon system, a world known as Golgotha, a planet that had previously weathered the storm of an orc invasion and even come to Armageddon's defense. However, the planet had siphoned off many of its resources and defenders precisely in that endeavour, and were not ready to stop a renewed invasion led by the beast himself. The planet was fairly quickly overrun, having been reduced to nothing but a handful of PDF regiments, and a virtually non-existent Imperial Navy presence. There was, as some of you might already know, also a little bit of drama on Golgotha, as Commissar Yarek decided to follow the beast out into the void and attempt to hunt him down, which culminated in a bit of a confrontation on the planet. But, well, it's kind of poorly documented, and honestly, I'd rather keep that for their individual lore episodes. So for the moment, all you really need to know is that the Imperium came to Armageddon, they then followed Gazgul out into space and to Golgotha, where Commissar Yarik was run over by his very own Baneblade, the Fortress of Arrogance. You can undoubtedly blame Yarik for many things, but um, the man has a sense of irony. And yes, Yarik did actually survive getting run over by a Baneblade. Don't ask me how, but he did. Actually, there's a little bit of confusion on this. Back in the older lore, it says that he was run over by an orc battle fortress, which, if anything, is even heavier, but hey, it's not as good a story as him getting run over by his own Baneblade, so that's the version I'm going to be going with for the purposes of this particular video. 
Suffice to say, the Commissar survived, was essentially rescued by Gazgul, who used him <laughs> as a very interesting little example to the rest of his orc boys, and then eventually let him go to return to Armageddon, because he figured that the fight would be a hell of a lot more interesting if the old man was back home leading an army. And while you might rightly point out that that appears to be a somewhat silly move, perhaps a little bit overconfident perhaps, to have one of your greatest enemies in your gigantic mechanical claws, and then just send him back home with a little tap on the ass and a kind request to organise the defences for your arrival. But then you would also be forgetting one simple fact. Gazgul was not necessarily heading to Armageddon to win a war, he was just going there to have a nice big fight. And you can't have a nice big fight if the enemy isn't ready for you. And this time the Imperium was ready, or at the very least as ready as they could be. In addition to the new reinforcements, the plant of Armageddon had also undergone an extensive program of restructuring and rebuilding. Obviously, the hives damaged by the orcs, and in some cases entirely overrun, would have to be rebuilt. This was done almost entirely through civilian labour. The work was very slow, however, due to the fact that numerous new regiments of planetary defence forces were raised from that very same pool of civilians. Nevertheless, Armageddon is a hive world, and it does have a lot of civvies to throw into the reconstructing efforts. Not to mention, of course, the simple fact that even though rebuilding a hive might be slow, that is in part due to the fact that it is essentially a man-made mountain of metal and hab blocks, and it had recently been occupied by the orcs, not exactly the gentlest of tenants. Additionally, after a short period of temporary governorship, the position of Overlord, the traditional ruler of Armageddon, was disbanded in favour of a council created by the Adeptus Administratum. The council would have representatives from the Imperial Guard, the Navy, the Departamento Minutorium, the Adeptus Mechanicus, the Ecclesiarchy, and one governor from each of the major hive cities of Armageddon. The council was led by General Kurov of the Imperial Guard. The general also had the de facto overall control of the Armageddon sector, as well as the surrounding planetary systems. Although it should be said that Commissar Yardik still held considerable political and military clout within the system. Basically, Kurov might be the official leader, but if he said something that Commissar Yardik did not agree with, well, you can bet your shiny little ass plate that most people in the Armageddon system would probably follow Yarek's instruction rather than Kurov. And to his credit, General Kurov was entirely aware of this and viewed this without a whole lot of rancor or resentment. He understood that Commissar Yarek was probably the only reason Armageddon was still Imperial, and he took his advice into consideration at all turns. But Armageddon was not the only planet undergoing a rather extensive program of rebuilding. The various other planets had also almost all been visited by the Orcs in some capacity or another. The important Imperial Navy bastion at St. Joan's Dock, for example, had been almost entirely wrecked. This was a bit of a problem. Because, as the name would suggest, St. Joan's Dock was the Imperial Navy's primary centre for resupply and rearmament of its various ships, as well as, duh, a dockyard. Fully complemented with repair facilities and hangars that could protect the various ships while they were either in de facto dry dock or in safe orbit. The dock facilities were repaired or entirely rebuilt where necessary, and many new docks were also created so that St. John's Dock could accommodate all manners of Imperial warships. This would be necessary since Armageddon had been granted considerable reinforcements, including Imperial Navy vessels that were much, much larger than the ones that could have been found in the Armageddon system during the First War. 
The Armageddon system as a whole also received extra defensive measures in the form of three monitoring stations that were placed along the outskirts of the system's edges to warn of any encroaching orc fleets. These three monitoring stations were named after the heroes of Armageddon, Mannheim, Yarek, and Dante. Do bear in mind, however, that these stations were not fortresses. They were most definitively armed, and fairly heavily armed as well, more than enough to chase off anything like low-level raiding bands or pirates, but they would not as much as slow an orc invasion. They were there entirely as a system of early warning. And said early warning was vital, because the Imperium simply cannot afford to heavily garrison a planet even as important as Armageddon. And while the planet's tithes to the Imperial Guard was reduced, and its Imperial Guard garrison as well as PDF troops increased, this was still not to a particularly huge degree. The planet was certainly far more heavily defended than most Imperial worlds, but the Imperium simply cannot afford to set good fighting men onto planets to wait for the possible return of an Orc Warlord. Instead, they would have to be out and about fighting the Greater War. As such, the planet of Armageddon still relied upon reinforcements arriving from outside of the Imperium to fight off any potential large-scale Orc invasions. And obviously, the more warning the Armageddon system had of any encroaching Orc hordes, the more time they would have to call for reinforcements. With all this in mind, the Imperial plan for defence was relatively simple. The Imperial Navy elements would engage the enemy as far away from Armageddon and indeed any populated planet in the system as possible, and then slowed them down for as long as possible. In an ideal circumstance, the enemy would be destroyed in space long before they got within striking distance of Armageddon, but, well, this is the Orcs we're dealing with here. They tend to have enough shit to throw at the wall to make any such hopes entirely pointless, but hey, it's always good to be optimistic. The plan in and of itself was fairly simple. At maximum range, the Imperial Navy's light squadrons would engage the enemy with hit-and-run tactics, attempting to bleed off as much strength as humanly possible from the main Orc thrust. If everything had gone to plan and the Orc force had been bled sufficiently, the Imperial Navy would then stand and engage the enemy in one final decisive battle, hopefully shattering the enemy and ending the war right then and there, before the Orcs could bring their numerical superiority on the ground into full effect. Of course, again, this was a very hopeful scenario, but the plan is still sound. The main possible differential is whether or not the enemy could be brought to that final battle before or after they had disgorged their troops onto Armageddon. If the enemy force was simply too large to be dispersed effectively and defeated in one single decisive confrontation, the Imperial Navy would simply just continue to pick away at the Orc Horde for however long as it was necessary to bring it down to a level where they could engage it and defeat it in one decisive decisive battle. Of course, if that didn't happen before they landed their shit on Armageddon, then, well, that would be little comfort to the people of Armageddon, but at the very least, there would be the chance of keeping the Orcs from going anywhere else, which, well, if you can't beat them in space and you can't beat them on the planets, you're gonna have to start going for tertiary objectives at that point. To achieve these objectives, the Imperial Navy presence in the Armageddon system was considerable, especially by garrisoning standards. First up, we have a total of 360 to 432 ships of Imperial Navy destroyer variants. These were usually organized into squadrons of 10 to 12 destroyer class vessels, or frigates. Furthermore, we have 48 to 60 heavy and grand cruisers, organized into six squadrons, ranging from 8 to 10 ships. These formations were usually designated as first-line squadrons, which essentially means that they are organized into larger formations than normal, so as to provide plenty of meat for a battle line. These squadrons also occasionally contain battle cruisers, and we know that at least two were present in Armageddon.
In contrast to that, we also have nine second line squadrons, usually ranging from four to eight cruisers for a total of 36 to 72. These are served as reinforcements to the first line and as a strategic reserve. These ships are also usually smaller, faster, and less heavily armed than armoured. And when not engaged in outright battle, these formations are usually given the task of escorting supplies and guarding the rear lines. Rounding out the Navy's presence, we have 12 light cruiser squadrons. These squadrons can be made up of anything from 3 to 12 ships, so total numbers here are a bit vague, somewhere around 36 to 144 ships. These light cruisers usually don't play a direct role in the main fleet actions, other than as hit-and-run attackers, but they serve an equally important purpose. They organise into wolf packs of smaller or larger concentrations, often several squadrons at a time, and harry the enemy's advance and supplies, bleeding off the enemy's strength in anticipation of a decisive battle. Leading all of this, we also have four battleships, the Triumph and His Will, both Apocalypse-class battleships, the Innomine Veritas, an Emperor-class battleship, and finally the Green Lake, an Oberon-class battleship. And then of course we have the attacker wings, stationed on the heavier ships. The Innomine Veritas alone could carry close to 2,000 bombers and interceptors. All in all, scattered across the fleet, we're looking at something along the lines of 2,600 Star Hawk Heavy Void Bombers and slightly above 4,000 Fury Interceptors. There are, of course, also several craft on Armageddon itself and the various planets. Unfortunately, we don't have any real good statistics for those. The Imperial Navy, broadly speaking, organises its on-planet assets in two ways. One is auxiliary forces, which are essentially made up of PDF flyers flying heavily outdated pieces of absolute shit that are placed under Imperial Navy command temporarily. Usually, temporarily, because they'll all get dead within the first week of combat, but occasionally they will be relieved later on, if anyone fucking survives. And then, of course, you have Imperial Naval Wings. In this case, the 5082nd. And unfortunately, the Imperial Navy considers this an adequate classification for non-ship-mounted forces. Generally speaking, this is because the Imperial Navy are not super fond of their ground-based friends. Although they are, in all due technicality, under Navy control, they are usually a liaison so closely with the Imperial Guard that they might as well be under Guard control. And generally speaking, the Marauders, Thunderbolts, and Lightnings used in atmospheric operations are not considered of much worth in void fighting, so we don't get any hard numbers for those, which means that they could could be anywhere between 1 to 10,000, so yeah. But of course, the Imperial Navy were not the only ones that came to Armageddon's defence. Now, do bear in mind, the Imperial Navy forces were the only ones on station at the time, but over the course of the campaign, the Emperor's Avenging Angels once more returned to Armageddon, bringing with them a total of 14 Astartes battle barges and 103 strike cruisers. We also have a small Adeptus Mechanicus contingent made up of a single Arc Mechanicus class battleship. But you and I both know this isn't going to end with some fancy smanshy space battle with lasers and torpedoes flying back and forth. This is inevitably going to get down to a bit of a ground battle as well. If the Orcs were lucky enough to get their green asses down to Armageddon, the Imperium strategy was twofold. Step one, run, hide, and perhaps cry to daddy. In fact, crying loudly to daddy and hoping that daddy will show up and rescue you is pretty much the cornerstone of this particular plan. In slightly more technical military terms, this plan essentially came down to the Imperial Guard forces retreating inside of their fortified hive cities and then keeping the orcs outside. Very little, if any, fighting would actually take place outside of the hive cities. 
Unfortunately for the defenders of the Imperium, Gazgul had showed himself to be rather competent when it came to manoeuvre battles, and he had a hell of a lot more shit with engines strapped to it than the Imperial Guard had, which meant that in all due likelihood he could outmanoeuvre the Imperial Guard formations and potentially cut them off and then simply overwhelm them with weight of numbers. And in that kind of a situation, it really doesn't matter what kind of casualties the Imperial Guard might be able to inflict upon the Orcs, because the Orcsies are almost guaranteed to have far more vehicle and a hell of a lot more Orcs than the IG are likely to have ammunition. Simply put, if any Imperial Guard force got cut off from reinforcements or outside the hives, they were as good as fucked. But there were a few occasions in which the Imperial Guard defenders simply could not hide behind the walls of their hives. For example, they simply could not ignore the southern polar ice cap, where the planet got most of its Prometheum. If the Orcs managed to occupy this, not only would it massively boost their own capabilities, it would also cut off the defenders from access to the vital fuel source. Some of Armageddon's defenders were also detached from Hive defense duties and ordered to operate in rapid moving and hard hitting convoys that will sweep up and down the various highways connecting the Hives. The idea was to deny the Orcs access to these vital transportation networks for as long as possible. These mobile forces were almost completely eradicated, and it was utterly expected that very, very few of them would ever return alive, but it was hoped that the speed with which these forces could move, and the fact that they carried enough fuel and supplies to be almost entirely self-sufficient for months at a time, that they would be able to deny these vital transportation arteries to the Orcs for long enough for reinforcements to arrive en masse and then liberate the Hive City. The second stage of the plan presumed that Imperial reinforcements had arrived in adequate numbers to start taking the fight to the Orcs themselves. Obviously, the defenders wished for further Imperial Guard forces, preferably armoured and or mechanised so that they could resist the rather temperamental climate of Armageddon, as well as being able to keep manoeuvring and not get surrounded by Gazgul's superior numbers. Additionally, a premium would of course be placed upon Adeptus Astartes forces, Titan Legions, and potentially also Adeptus Mechanicus support in the form of Skitarii or other support elements that would normally be attached to said titans. There was also a plan to bring a certain secret weapon onto the battlefield, however it was not officially sanctioned. The weapon in question was an Ordinatus engine. These are rather specialised weapons. The basic idea is that you take starship level weaponry and place it on a massive mobile platform. In the case of Ordinatus Armageddon, it carried a absolutely ginormous plasma-based Nova cannon. This is usually armament placed only on the heaviest of battleships, and in that case, a single Nova cannon will require almost the entire energy production of a fully-fledged Mechanicus battleship. They are horrifying weapons, capable of smashing through the void shields of Titans in a single shot. The Ordinatus Armageddon is perhaps the heaviest single artillery piece ever deployed by the Imperium of Man. It was originally placed on Armageddon after the... never mind about that, the Inquisition's knocking on my door again, we'll get into that later. In all due technicality, the fact that the Ordinatus engine was even on Armageddon was a secret. However, a certain Black Templar decided that it shouldn't be a secret anymore. The Black Templars are very, very keen on basically taking every single piece of heavy machinery, spike club, rock, or anything else they could possibly hurl at the foe, and do precisely that. The Black Templars are not particularly fond of the idea of strategic reserves, or that some weapons might be just a little bit too big or too uh, vital to spend outright. However, 
the Mechanicus disagreed. They had sent a full-on Titan crew under the command of a Princep to take command of the Ordinatus. Now, rather than normal Titan crews, the guys operating Ordinatus level weapons are even more specialised, and the weapon was also expected to take several months just to activate. To put it rather bluntly, if the Mechanicus got their way, they would be opening the bunkers onto a planet completely and utterly over run by orcs six or seven years after the final orc of victory. The Black Templars did not agree with this uh, cautious approach, and instead basically hijacked the damn thing, and used it to great effect, but we'll get into that a little bit later. For now, let's get a little bit back to the plan. So, assuming Imperial reinforcements had arrived, step one was to break the sieges of the Hives. This would preferably be done by deep strike operations carried out by Adeptus Astartes reinforcements, where the good old Angels of Death would drive a spear tip straight into the heart of the Orc Horde, after which the spear or shaft of the Imperial Guard would follow and drive it home, scattering the Orc Hordes away from the Hives, allowing the reinforcements to take up position within the hives, reinforce, reorganize, and then take the fight to the orcs, where once again, the Adeptus Astartes would act as a rapid reaction force, smashing apart the largest concentrations of orcs, and then leaving the Imperial Guard to take care of the cleanup. And ideally, if at all possible, the biggest and the baddest of the Space Marines, led by Commander Dante himself, would find and absolutely buttfuck the Beast of Armageddon, until finally the great Green Warlord cried uncle. That, of course, was the hope. However, Gazgor had proven himself to be a remarkably sneaky little bastard during the First War, and it was not expected that he'd be making himself an easy target. Presuming that this first step was carried out successfully, step two would then be to establish proper front lines, then continuously cut off smaller concentrations of orcs until finally the entire orc infestation was destroyed, and then, step three, hand over control back to the Armageddon Steel Legion, the Planetary Defense Force, and the Imperial Guard Defenders, clean the planet once again with good old-fashioned fire and Prometheum, and hopefully put Gazgul's corpse in the ground, presumably in a public latrine somewhere. It all sounds so simple, doesn't it? But the old saying, no plan survives first contact with the enemy, was to prove itself once again. Fifty-seven years to the day, as previously mentioned, after the first orc invasion of Armageddon, the beast returned. And he returned with a lot more friends than even the Imperium expected him to bring. The first sign that an absolutely apocalyptic shitstorm was incoming was a massive increase in orc raids in the nearby systems, quickly followed by a massive escalation. It appeared that the Beast had been planning this for a while. The Armageddon system itself was slowly but surely being surrounded. Merchant shipping to Armageddon was almost cut in half as surrounding planets were put under orc assault. Over the course of the next few months, dozens of Imperial worlds were placed under effective siege by the orcs. The Imperial Navy forces present, of course, did their best to slow the rate at which the orcs were raiding, pillaging, and burning shit, but the simple fact was that they were bound to Armageddon. Armageddon. They could not roam as freely as they would like, because they knew where the main thrust would hit. This was perhaps another folly of Gazgul. If he had simply bypassed Armageddon, he might have been able to get around it without any real fight. However, Gazgul would never do something so silly, and at the end of the day, Armageddon was the linchpin of the system. Without it, there was always the threat of a large enemy force to the orc's rear. Not to mention, a considerable potential for reinforcements being brought in right up his little green bumhole. 
So in the end, the beast would return to Armageddon. But before that, the Imperial Navy's presence was already weakened by the need to defend the nearby planets. Most of these planets were able to hold on, seeing as they had been prepared for this, although several did fall, most were reconquered later, but we have fairly little information upon these systems. So we will get to the actual arrival of Gazgul himself. And Gazgul arrived like the greatest war boss that has ever lived should, in style. Carrying out a remarkably bold manoeuvre, thousands of orc ships ripped their way out of the warp dangerously close to the outer envelopes of the Armageddon system. This is not a jump that any Imperial Guard officers would ever have even dreamed of trying. As you probably know at this point, the warp is extremely relative, and only the rules of the warp actually apply. Even though we are talking about distances stretching into hundreds of millions of kilometers. In the warp, that doesn't necessarily matter for diddly dick. A couple hundred million kilometers might as well be a couple seconds of warp travel, or it could be goddamn years. It doesn't really matter much in the warp. However, the distance that Gazgul jumped into the system with was considered to be virtually fucking suicidal. At that kind of range, and especially with orc technology being what it is, most of his ships had a roughly equal chance to smacking into a planet, or appearing inside of asteroids, or the goddamn sun for that matter, and God Emperor alone, or perhaps Gazgul, knows how many hundreds of thousands, if not millions of orcs met an untimely end at this point, but there was a lot of orcs. And as if by some divine intervention by Gork and Mork, it would appear that the overwhelming majority had arrived safely. And to give you a general indication of how close we're talking here, you remember those three monitoring stations, Dante, Yarek, and Manaheim, that was placed in the very outermost stretches of the system? Well, the first warning the Imperium had of the incoming Orc Horde, other than the massive psychic shockwave, was a warning message sent by Dante, which was interrupted midway by the station exploding. The Orcs had practically warped in directly on top of the defense station. A heavily defended, armored and armed space monitoring station, a station that at the very least was expected to survive for a few hours, enough to send back a nice solid warning and a good force estimate, was wiped out in less time than it takes to say, oh fuck, the Orcs are... Though granted that in and of itself should be a pretty good indication of what's coming. And it was truly a rather magnificent thing that was making its way into the Armageddon system. Even in the most pessimistic of estimates, the Imperium had not even come close to the size of the Orc fleet that was making its way into the Armageddon system. Some estimates place the Orc fleet at something along the lines of 400 plus cruiser-sized vessels. God only knows how many thousands of other classifications. These are Orcs, obviously, so classifications are kinda pointless here. Generally speaking, an orc ship will start out as whatever tiny creature and vessel it is that they can capture, being it Imperial Guard vessel, some scratch homemade piece of shit or whatever, and then over the ship's life, if it is so lucky as surviving a single goddamn battle, which is unlikely being an orc ship, but still, it will take on scrap, and increase in size, and firepower, and armor, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on, in a crude simulacrum of the orcs themselves. Basically, classifying orc ships is entirely fucking pointless, but the various Imperial estimates states that at least 400 ships of cruiser to heavy cruiser size were spotted, and thousands of others. Additionally, somewhere between 80 to 100 orc rocks were in the system, and 12 to 16 full-on space hulks. Unfortunately, again, classifying a Space Hulk in terms of battleships, heavy cruisers, etc. is equally fucking pointless. It is an entirely different thing. 
A Space Hulk is a massive conglomeration of dozens, sometimes even hundreds of ships that have been lost in the warp, smashed together on the tides of the Imperium into a gigantic, disgusting, gorgant ball of whatever the fuck, and spat back out into the material universe. When these things are occupied by orcs, they will of course rig up whatever weapon systems they can get their hands on. They don't give all that much of a shit if they're pointing in the right directions, if they use too much or too little energy, etc. They pretty much just care about turning the entire goddamn thing into a massive space porcupine, with massed batteries of lance weapons, torpedoes, rockets, and of course innumerable strike craft launch bays, etc., etc., and then proceed to fill the void with every ounce of firepower they could possibly muster. It isn't particularly precise, it isn't particularly elegant, and it might pose as much of a threat to the Orc fleet as it does to the Imperium, but, well, there's a lot more Orcs than there are Imperials, so that doesn't really matter. Not to mention, destroying a Space Hulk is virtually impossible from the outside. The thing could have literal kilometers of armor in places, and there is a very little way other than directly scouting the craft to determine which parts would be vulnerable. Hell, even just getting a decent reading on the ship's drives is practically impossible, since they will usually be running off several dozen power sources, and then determining which of those power sources is the main one, which ones are the important ones, and which one are even goddamn fully operational or plugged into the engines. Well, let's just say that shooting at a Space Hulk is the literal definition of a crapshoot. The preferred way of knocking one out is to board it with as many Adeptus Astartes as you can get your hands on, and then just simply let the angry power-armed little muffins tear their way through the hull into every power source they can get their hands on, and butchering the crew. To put it another way, trying to sink a Space Hulk with normal void weapons would be like trying to sink an iceberg with muskets. And as if that wasn't bad enough, the Space Hulks and the Rocks proved to be the perfect launch platforms for endless waves of multi-purpose Orc Fighter Bombers, or FIGHTER BOMBERS, as the Orcs would call them. These crafts, as with, again, pretty much all Orc craft, defy any easy definition. But generally speaking, it will be about the size of an Imperial Thunderbolt, and it will be able to operate both in the void and in atmosphere. Granted, a human pilot probably wouldn't be able to operate it in either, seeing as the thing virtually has nothing in the way of control surfaces, or anything in the way of, you know, airtight pressurized compartments and stuff like that, but these are relatively minor concerns for an orc. Additionally, such worthless concepts as aerodynamics or power-to-weight ratios are rendered entirely pointless in the face of orc determination, which means that these aircraft, although relatively small, or void craft, or whatever you want to call them, can usually carry a hell of a lot more explosives than an equivalent imperial craft could possibly hope to carry. And while they are horrifyingly outclassed by the Imperial Fury interceptors in Void Warfare, and they're also not particularly good compared to Thunderbolts or Lightnings, there is an god-awful lot of them. Based on Imperial kill statistics and a rough estimate from the sensory logs, there was something along the lines of a quarter to one million of these crafts in system. Additionally, we also have so-called assault crafts. These are basically just manned torpedoes that occasionally have something like a steering system, usually operated by a grot or something, that is launched en masse from orc ships, filled to the absolute brim with orc boys. They could be considered kinda the orc equivalent of boarding torpedoes, although comparing a boarding torpedo to one of these assault ships would be like comparing a Ferrari to a Lada. They, in all due technicality, fulfill the same basic role of getting you from point A to B hopefully alive, although the success rate and how they do it could not be more different. The massive Orc Assault did have one drawback, however. 
One, it was blindingly fucking obvious what was happening. There was absolutely no subterfuge in this particular hammer blow, which allowed the Imperium plenty of time to react. Because even though the Orcs had warped in suicidally close to the system, we're still talking about weeks, if not months, of travel before they even get within striking distance of Armageddon. The Imperial fleet had been expecting this and had been scattered out throughout the system as a rapid response force. The main defensive force was in station above Armageddon within 24 hours of Dante's warning, and within five days, leading elements of the Imperial Navy engaged the Orc attack crafts as they coasted into the system. They launched a ferocious ambush against the Orc Admada as they were slinging their way around the high gravity world of Pellucidar. The Imperial force, consisting mostly of light cruisers under the command of Admiral Parole, caught the Orcs completely by surprise and destroyed 60 ships with no losses of their own. Unfortunately for the brave Admiral, he simply couldn't kill the Orcs fast enough, and more and more Orc ships kept arriving, including the addition of several of the Orcs' heavier cruisers. The small force under Admiral Prowl was forced to retreat and disengage quickly before being overwhelmed. In so doing, they destroyed perhaps as many as 120 ships in total, and destroyed thousands of Orcs attack crafts. This engagement was to become rather typical of the early Void of War for Armageddon. The Imperium would lash out against the Orc invader in an attempt to slow down or disrupt the Orc force. This would result in a smaller Imperial force quickly being engaged by massive numbers of Orc ships. In these engagements, the Imperial Navy destroyed hundreds of Orc crafts, however, they could never actually carry out their primary objective, which was to slow down or dissipate the main thrust. There simply was too many enemies. Every time the Imperium engaged the Orc fleet, they were assaulted by waves upon waves of crafts, and if the Imperial fleet did not almost immediately begin retreating, they risked being surrounded by these hordes of enemies streaming in from all directions and suffering heavy casualties. This severely limited the effectiveness of the Imperial Navy, as they were essentially reduced to picking apart the outer shells of the horde instead of driving a nail straight through the center. Nevertheless, the Imperial Navy was succeeding in slowing down the Orc advance. At this rate, the Orcs might even be slowed enough for large-scale Imperial reinforcements to arrive in the Armageddon sector. And given the current rate of casualties, the Imperial Navy might even be able to completely deplete the Orc attack. They probably would not be able to prevent a landing, but they would be able to severely limit the amount of Orcs that were capable of making landfall, and probably even be able to bring the Orcs to one final decisive battle and eradicate the vast majority of them in space. The casualty estimates that laid the groundwork for this rather optimistic view on the war was the fact that the Orcs were currently trading 12 to 1. On average, 12 Orc ships were destroyed for every single Imperial ship. Additionally, the Imperial Navy had easy access to repair stations and dockyards. This allowed the Imperial Navy to recover the vast majority of their combat losses, as long as the Orcs didn't salvage them first, even heavily damaged wrecks could be dragged to nearby ports, and over the course of months, and probably years, they would be fully restored. The Orcs did not have this advantage. The best they could hope was to salvage their own ships, and add their weapons, armor, and internal systems onto already existing ships. They relied almost entirely on out-of-system reinforcements, which meant that even the Orcs could not sustain this rate of casualties for very long. But Gazgul hadn't come all the way to Armageddon to be stopped now. The massive Orc Armada that the Imperial Navy figured they could just about dissipate and destroy, with only minor forces making planet fall on Armageddon, was to turn out to be but one of three fleets pushing into the Armageddon system. The other two had appeared further out. The original fleet was a decoy. <laughs> 
a remarkably sneaky move by Orc standards. The other two fleets were able to coast into the Armageddon system with very little in the way of direct opposition. And the first the Imperial Navy knew about it was when they received deep space intelligence reports from the two remaining monitoring stations, Manaheim and Yarek. At this point, the Imperial Navy was almost fully engaged in the action that had grown out of the initial ambush five days after the Orcs' original appearance. These two new fleets that appeared a few days after the start of this prolonged space battle came in from completely different directions. This meant that if the Imperial Navy was to have any hope of intercepting them, they would now have to begin disengaging while under constant fire and attacks from the original Orc fleet, and assuming the entire Imperial Navy wasn't wiped out right then and there, because disengaging from Orcs is a tricky business, to put it rather bluntly. They would then have to send one small force to deal with each of the three major Orc navies. And considering the fact that the combined strength of the Armageddon Defense Force could barely halt one of them, splitting the navy forces into three smaller groupings seemed like utter suicide. And luckily for the Imperium, Admiral Parole understood that his ultimate task was not necessarily to protect Armageddon from Orc landings, but to give the defenders of Armageddon the best chance possible to defeat said landings, and if they could not do that, his task was to defend the rest of Segmentum Solar. Therefore, he ordered all the Imperial and Navy elements to break off contact from the Orcs, and rather than engage the two new Orc fleets, he ordered them to scatter in the outer edges of the system, and prepare themselves to launch retaliatory and harassing strikes against the Orc Horde as they began landfall on Armageddon. The plan now was no longer to bleed off forces for one final battle, it was rather to give the defenders of Armageddon every possible advantage the navy could provide them with, by harassing the enemy's supply lines, by drawing off reinforcements, and of course by killing as many orcs in the void as they could without risking their own ships. At this point, the Imperial Navy simply had to survive. Ideally, Imperial reinforcements would arrive in large enough forces for the Imperial Navy to resume an offensive stance against the Greenskin, but if not, they might eventually be forced out of the system entirely, and then just simply prevent the orcs from reaching deeper into the Segmentum as a whole. But for any of that plan to even be remotely relevant, first the Imperial Navy had to extract itself from the predicament it currently found itself so badly entangled in. After the original engagements, the Imperial Naval Forces had been engaged in almost a continuous running battle for close to a week and now they had to withdraw from this battle while maintaining as much of their forces as possible. This proved to be rather complicated. The Orcs had clearly planned for this, which in and of itself was remarkable. Almost simultaneously with the appearance of the two other Orc prongs, the Orc attacks intensified in strength, power, and in direction. The Orcs had previously simply been hurling themselves at the Imperial guns, attempting to take down whatever target would present itself to them. Now, however, they began focusing on the valuable larger ships, the linchpins that would have to be there to hold the line in the event of a potential retreat. In one of these escalations, five Orc kill cruisers suddenly turned their attention upon the Triumph, one of the two Apocalypse-class battleships in the system. The kill cruisers had previously been fully engaged with other Imperial Navy elements in the same battle, but suddenly they now shifted their attention entirely to the Triumph. After a prolonged engagement, the combined firepower of the kill cruisers overloaded the venerable old ship's void generators and crippled her. In one bold and admittedly costly stroke, the Orcs had managed to take out one of the two Apocalypse-class battleships in system, and reduce the total number of battleships from four to three. This was a considerable loss to the Imperial forces. The two Apocalypse class, as well as the single Oberon, were the only three battleships that could potentially be used in a rear guard action. The Emperor class is a large-scale attack craft carrier. It lacks both offensive and defensive capabilities in a straight-up fight, and would not be very useful in a rearguard action. Suddenly, Admiral Parole realised the Orc's plans. 
they would throw the Imperial Navy out of balance with the appearance of these further two prongs. Once the Imperial Navy began to retreat, the Orcs would launch almost suicidal attacks against the very ships that would necessarily have to protect such a retreat, thereby rendering the Imperial Navy open to massive casualties. Unfortunately for Gaz Ghul, Admiral Parol was a far more cautious Imperial commander than most Navy Admirals. Generally speaking, Navy Admirals have a rather low opinion of the Orcs and their tactical acume. However, Admiral Parol had studied Commissar Yarek, and he knew that the Beast was no normal Orc warlord. And it was in no small part due to this understanding that the Admiral issued the order to disentangle the fleet in short order a decision that many would have considered premature, and indeed, he received several protests from his captains who reckoned they could still inflict substantial casualties upon the Orcs, before any Orc reinforcements could arrive. The captains argued that Parol was needlessly cautious, and that he willfully increased the burden that would settle upon the defender's planet side. However, the Admiral's decision was to be quickly validated. The captains had namely forgot to account for one thing, namely that they were fighting orcs. The captains had reckoned that they could not possibly escalate the confrontation any further. The orc ships were already practically throwing themselves at the Imperium's guns, and the Imperial fleet was holding. And thusly, the various captains assumed that they could simply sit upon their Aquila thrones and wait for the orcs to annihilate themselves, and only begin disentangling themselves when it became clear that the other orc forces were moving in to reinforce. Unfortunately, these were, as mentioned, orcs, and there is no situation in which an orc cannot attack more ferociously. And while the loss of the Apocalypse-class battleship was a heavy weight, if it had not been for Admiral Parole's swift decision-making, a lot more would likely have been lost in the following hours. As it was, the Imperial Navy was successful in disengaging with the Orc Armada. The Navy was battered, bruised, and worst of all, scattered. Many of the ships had had to break away individually rather than in formations. Admiral Parole himself had been reduced to a few cruiser squadrons and a single battleship, with the rest of the Navy's forces scattered throughout the system. Those who could reorganized to continue with the second stage of the proposed plan. The survivors would organize into squadrons based around one or two heavy crafts, preferably grand or battle cruisers, which would act as the spearhead, while a formation of light cruisers would drive that very same point through the Orcs rear lines, destroying troop transports, supply ships, and hopefully drawing further Orc ships away from Armageddon. And this would almost certainly have worked against any other Orc horde, but once again, the Imperium was not dealing with any other Orc. They were dealing with Gazgul Mag Uruk Thraka, who had seen this move coming. Rather than finding the soft, squishy underbelly of the Orc Armada, the Imperial Navy ran straight into a brand new Orc weapon. Massive asteroids propelled through the warp by a gargantuan rocket engine, apparently simply bolted to the back of these huge rocks, were hurtling through space and guarding the Orc's rear lines. These strange contraptions proved to be extremely frustrating to the Imperium's raiding efforts. They proved to be impervious to anything but the most direct and determined of assaults. The massive Orc rocks were practically covered in guns, ranging from massive void ship killing monstrosities down to simple anti personnel machine guns. And in addition to all of this firepower, the rocks also turned out to be very, very hard to kill. Even if the Imperial ships were able to pound their way through the kilometre-thick crust of the asteroid, they would then have to penetrate several metres of heavily reinforced bulkheads, and then they would have to hit something important enough to stop the rock from firing back at them. And to make matters worse, as with all things orcish, the enemy had absolutely no shortage of these massive space fortresses. Somewhere between 80 to 100 unique rocks were recorded in the Armageddon sector. A little bit of the 80 to 100 here comes from the fact that, well, they're fucking asteroids. 
It's difficult to tell one cobbled together hunk of batshit insane metal, guns and rockets from another cobbled together hunk of batshit insane rockets and guns. The distinction is there, but it's a fine one. And this newest challenge radically changed the second stage of the Imperial plan. Now that they were almost entirely prevented from raiding the Orcs' back lines, they have to just make do with trying to lure away as many Orc ships as possible. Determined attacks were launched on several of the rocks, and a few of them were destroyed, and some minor damage were inflicted to the Orcs' rear lines. But generally speaking, the Orc transport ships, their reinforcements and their supplies all made it to armor. Armageddon. They did, however, manage to bleed off a fairly considerable amount of orc ships. The orcs are not the most disciplined of species, and basically every time the Imperial Navy launched an attack, they would draw off several dozen orc ships, which they would then deal with with further Imperial Navy forces, or by drawing them into ambushes or gravitic minefields that had been sown all throughout the sector, specifically for this kind of happenstance. Meanwhile, the defenders of Armageddon were shitting their britches as they were preparing to receive one of the largest orc invasions in Imperial history. They did at least comfort themselves that the Imperial Navy had slowed them down to some small extent, and that the orcs would probably be waylaid for a while while they dealt with some of the outlying planets and of course the monitoring station. Yarik, Manaheim, and Dante had already all been destroyed, but several smaller stations were still active. Unfortunately for the defenders of Armageddon, these stations were destroyed in practically moments as far as void combat is concerned, and the orcs, very, very unorkily, completely and utterly ignored the other plans in the system. The only other location that received at least a little bit of of attention was St. John's Dock. Normally this would have been a primary strategic target for any invading force, since it would deny the Imperial Navy access to rearmament and of course repairs. However, the Orcs appeared to not be particularly interested. They did get close enough to bombard the dock system rather heavily. Basically, the entire Orc fleet just did a drive-by on the poor place, pounding it into absolute rubble with anything and everything they could get their hands on. Additionally, some of the more enthusiastic elements of the Armada decided to launch themselves directly at the dockyards. This would not appear to be a part of Gazgul's plan, rather this would just be a case of orcish enthusiasm overtaking their sensibilities, since these orcs never received any sort of substantial reinforcements. However, they were still orcs, and there were still a fairly lot of them, and St. John's Dock was relying on the Imperial Navy to protect it. That very navy was currently running pell-mell away from the orc armada that was bombarding the planet, so... Good luck with that one. It took a long time to clean out the orcs. The orcs proved to be remarkably good at fighting in the heavily industrialized docking systems of St. John's Dock. Basically, the green little bastards would bury deep down inside of the various slag pits and other virtually lethal areas of the massive industrial complex and launch raids against the larger population, blowing up all kinds of valuable stuff. It wasn't until much later in the war and the deployment of two Ordo Zeno's kill teams that the orcs were finally rooted out. So, bearing in mind everything that has happened so far, what was the situation like? The orcs had broken through the outer defences, it had taken them around about two weeks to scatter the Imperial Navy. The reinforcements were not being met with any substantial attacks by the Imperial Navy and would therefore not be slowed. The Imperial Navy itself had been scattered throughout the system, and was now reduced to launching lightning strikes against the Orc's rear lines. They had, however, succeeded in slowing down the Orc Armada somewhat. Additionally, Gazgul's subterfuge, although it had almost certainly gained him a massive upper hand against the Navy, had slowed down its assault on Armageddon. As a result, significant Imperial reinforcements arrived on the planet before the Orcs could launch their attack properly. Amongst them were several Imperial Guard regiments and Adeptus Astartes formations. At the time before the Beast had arrived, forces from over 20 chapters had deployed onto the planet. The planet also received substantial reinforcements in terms of material, foodstuffs, and other valuables.
and perhaps most decisive of all of these reinforcements was the very last shuttle to break through the Orc blockade before the planet was put under full siege. This shuttle carried the legendary Commissar Yarek himself, returning to Armageddon after a 20 year long absence. Shortly after the Commissar's arrival, the Orcs had fully surrounded the planet and begun launching their assault upon its defences. It had taken the Orcs six weeks to travel this far into the system. Much, much faster than the Imperium had hoped and reckoned with, but a little bit slower than they potentially could have. And so began the last major void engagement in these opening moves in the war for Armageddon. The planet itself had been extensively fortified against a Void-born assault. Again, the original Imperial plan was of course to destroy the enemy entirely in orbit, or leave them weak enough for the orbital defences to deal with. As such, the planet had been equipped with several anti-orbit weapon silos and complexes. Additionally, the world was protected by orbiting weapons platforms and Imperial space stations, with firepower the equivalent to that of a small fleet. However, the Orc fleet was very, very far from small and over the course of three days and two nights of continuous assault, the orbital defence stations were all reduced to orbital debris. And against the darkening sky of the third night, contrails of orc drop pods and assault ships could be seen as they streaked out of the heavens down onto the planet below, along with one contrail much, much bigger than all the others. But that is going to have to wait until next week. For now, we've looked at the opening moves of the second Orc invasion of Armageddon, and yes, this is gonna be a long one. To give you a general indication, there's something along the lines of four to five times as much source material for the second Orc invasion as there was for the first, so strap yourself in, lads. This is going to be a wild ride. Until next time, I have been Arch. Thank you very much for watching, and I do hope to see you all again soon. Have a good day.